let me just ask in terms of your worries of, if we look a hundred years from now, we're in the middle of what is now a natural pandemic that from the looks of it, is fortunately is not as bad as it could have possibly been. If you look at the Spanish flu, if you look at the history of pandemics, if you look at all the possible pandemics that could have been, that, that uh, folks like Bill Gates are exceptionally terrified about. We've, uh, uh, I know many people are suffering, uh, but it's, it's, it's better than it could have been. Uh, so, and now, now we're talking about nuclear weapons. In terms of existential threats to us as sinful humans, uh, what worries you the most? Is it nuclear weapons? Is, is it uh, natural pandemics, engineered pandemics, nanotechnology? In my field of artificial intelligence, some people <laughs> are, are afraid of uh, killer robots. and Robots, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is there, do you think in those existential terms, uh, and, and do any aspect, do any of those things worry you? I am certainly not confident that my children and grandchildren will experience the benefits of civilization that I have enjoyed. I think it's possible for our civilizations to break down catastrophically. Um, I also think that it's possible for our civilizations to break down progressively. And I think they will if we continue to have the explosion of population on the planet that we currently have. I mean, it's it's quite it's quite wrong to think of our problems as mostly being CO two. If we can just solve CO two, then we can go on having this you know continually expanding economy everywhere in the world. Of course, you can't do that. Okay, I mean there is a finite you know bearing capacity of our planet on the resources of our planet on yeah. the resources of our planet, and and we can't continue to do that. So. I think there are lots of technical reasons why um, a continually expanding economy and and uh, and civilization is impossible, and that therefore, um, actually, I'm as much nervous about the fact that our population is eight billion or something uh, right now worldwide as I am about um, the fact that you know a few million people would be would be killed by COVID nineteen. I mean, I don't want to be <laughs> callous about this, but from the big picture, it seems like that's much more of a problem. Overpopulation, people not dying is ultimately more of a problem uh, than people dying. Um, so, you know, that probably sounds incredibly callous to your, to your listeners, but I think it's simply, you know, a sober assessment of the, of the situation. Is there, is there ways from the way those 8 billion or 7 billion or whatever the number is live that could make it sustainable. Uh, you know, because you've kind of implied there's a kind of, uh, we have, especially in the West, this kind of capitalist view of um, really consuming a lot of resources. Is there a way to, like, if you could change uh, one thing or a few things, what would you change to make this life, uh, make it more likely that your grandchildren have uh, a better life than you. Well, okay. So let, let's talk a bit about energy because that's something I know a lot, a lot about, having thought about it most of my career. In order to reach a steady state CO2 level, okay, that's acceptable in terms of global climate change and so on and so forth, we need to reduce our carbon emissions by at least a factor of 10 worldwide, okay? What's more, you know, um, the average energy consumption and hence CO2 emission of people in the world is less than a tenth of what we, per capita, of than what we have in the West, in America, and Europe, and so forth. So if you have in mind some utopia in the future where we've, where we've reached a sustainable use of energy, and we've also reached a, a situation in which there's far less inequity in the world in the sense that people have share the energy resources more uniformly, then what, what, what that is equivalent to would be to reduce the CO2 emissions in Western economies, not by a factor of 10, but by a factor of 100. In other words, it has to go down to 1% of what it is now, okay? 
Yeah. So, you know, when people talk about, uh, you know, let's use natural gas because, you know, maybe it only uses 60% of the energy of coal. It's complete nonsense. We're, that's not, not even scratching the surface of what we would need to do. So, <laughs> you know, is that going to be feasible? I, I, I very much doubt it. And therefore, I actually doubt that we can reach um, a level of energy, um, of, of fossil energy use that is 1% of the current use in the West without totally dramatic changes, either in you know, our society, our use of, of energy and so yeah. forth, which actually, of course, is much of that energy is used for producing food and so on and so forth. So it's actually not so obvious that we can we can get we can cut down our energy usage by that factor or we've got to reduce the human population population so you run up against that number that's increasing still uh, and you don't think there could be it's depressing no it's it's not uh it's not it's not it's not depressing it's um uh, it's difficult like many Very truths good. are <laughs> uh, uh do you do you have a hope uh that there could be a technological solution in what? short, no. There is no technological solution to, for example, for population control. I mean, we, we have the technology just, you know, to prevent ourselves bearing children. That's not a problem. Technology is in, okay? Solved. The challenge is society. The challenge is ch human choices. The, ch the challenge is p almost entirely human and sociological, not technology not technology. And when people th talk about energy, they, they think that there's some kind of technological magic bullet for this, but there isn't, okay? And, and there isn't for the reasons I just mentioned. Not because it's obvious there isn't, but actually there isn't. Uh, and and in, in any case, um, the, it's true of energy, it's true of pollution, it's true of human population, it's true of most of the big challenges in our society are not scientific or technological challenges. They're human sociological challenges. And that's why I think it's a terrible mistake, um, even for folks like me who work at, you know, well, the high temple of science and technology <laughs> in in America and yeah. maybe in the galaxy. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, it's- it's, it's MIT. A, it's a, MIT. Best university in the world. <laughs> it's, it's a terrible mistake if yeah. we give the impression that technology is going to solve it all, technology will make tr tremendous contributions, and I think it's it's worth working on it. But it's a disaster if you think it's going to solve all of our problems. And and actually, um, you know, I've written a whole book about the question of uh, of scientism and the and the overemphasis on science, both as a way of of solving problems through technology, but also as a way of gaining knowledge. I think it's not all of the knowledge there is either.